So anyway, guys, let me introduce Brenton Lango. He is here with me, back on the line. <laughs> What's up, Brenton? Hey, hey! Happy to be back. Um, it's been about a month since our debate, um, which I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, and I've been I've been pretty busy, but I made some time to come on here and talk to you. <laughs> I appreciate you doing that, guys. Brenton Langle, L E N G E L, and that's mm -hmm. his uh, Twitter handle, by the way. Brenton B R E N T O N is a playwright, a Ringo Award nominated comic creator, mm -hmm. an Appalachian Trail two thousand miler. Yep. Which means you hiked the Appalachian Trail for 2,000 miles or what? Yep, Maine to Georgia. Wow, impressive. Yeah, I also wrote the first play ever about it, which is called North to Maine. It's played twice in New York, got great reviews, and is uh, sponsored by the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Wow, that's cool. Congratulations. So Thanks. Yeah, one of the better things I did in my life. <laughs> so coming on, doing YouTube stuff and appearing on Modern Day Debate is just basically a hobby for you then. Yeah, at this point, yeah, it's a hobby. It's it's odd, and we'll kind of get into this. It's also somewhat of a uh, religious duty for me. <laughs> but yeah, mostly mostly a hobby. I really love arguments. Uh, I love to talk to people uh, about important uh, things that folks are passionate about and uh, kind of dissect them and, you know, give my own perspective on the world. Yeah. Um, I One thing I really appreciated about our debate on Modern Day Debate, it was like August 20. Six, I forget what it was. Yeah, it was in About late August. <laughs> we talked about has Black Lives Matter done more harm than good? And I, pre when I presented my arguments, one thing I appreciated about you was that you really tried to understand and kind of restate my arguments and understand where I was coming from with them. And mm -hmm. I appreciated that. that was cool. Yeah, that's really important to me. Um, I really feel like debate too often, especially online, gets pulled into this space of like, I just want to win and own the other person. And the, the problem is, when that happens, it's really entertaining for a lot of people. But no. Oh, he cut out. He cut out there. Hang tight, guys. Mm -hmm. it's, what, it's really entertaining for some people, but what? Because you cut out but, there. Oh, nobody learns anything. Oh, you yeah. know, um, and I really feel like debate isn't just about it's not just a spectator sport. Um, you know, I think it can there. There's a level that it can elevate to where it can connect people and where people can get, a, uh, you know, uh, if not new ideas, but just a better understanding of our fellow of our fellow complicated humans. Were you raised a Christian? Me? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was raised uh, Catholic. Oh, OK. And so are, are you a Catholic to this day at all in any sense? Oh, no, definitely not. No, I've, I've lapsed, though. It's it's funny. I'm working on uh, I have currently have a Kickstarter running for my series about uh, anarchist Buenaventura de Rudy, which is what this background is from. And um, there's some underlying spiritual things going on in the comic uh, and in the, the movie that I wrote. And when I was like summing it up. Oh, he cut out again. Hang on. Hang on. He. You cut out. You cut out there when you were summing oh. it. When you were summing it up, what? When I was summing it up for my artist in the in the script I was sending him, uh, I was talking a little bit about some of the underlying spiritual points, and I was I thought to myself, I was like, man, did I lap so hard I became a Catholic again? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, so you, it, it's interesting just because my headspace is back in like Spain in the 1930s now because of the because of the uh, series. You so. Did you turn into an atheist? A lot of my atheist friends are, were what they called recovering Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, I was an atheist for a short period in New York, like I think 2012 to 2014 ish. Um, you know, I was influenced by the new atheist movement and Christopher Hitchens, uh, hence one of the reasons I like debate. Um, but I eventually, in around 2014, I, I was beginning to find an end in that uh, philosophy. Like it just, it, it wasn't working for me. And then there was a day I suddenly found I had my faith again. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is happening. <laughs> Got to find something to do with it. Um, not going to be a Christian. Uh, and so I became a practicing Buddhist uh, with Soka Gakkai International. And so a Buddhist can be anything. A Buddhist can be an atheist or believe in God. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, correct. Buddhism, uh, 
Buddhism is a very compatible. So like you can, from a Buddhist perspective, you can be a Christian and a Buddhist or a Buddhist and an atheist or a Buddhist and a Hindu. Um, it, it's what's in the West. Uh, religion tends to be about right thought in that you have the right ideas, the right metaphysical assumptions about the world. Whereas in the East and particularly with Buddhism and my, and my sect, it's less about what you think and more about right practice. You can have the complete wrong ideas about the world, but if you do the practice, like that's what's important spiritually and you will develop from there. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah, I think we need both. I think we definitely need mm -hmm. both. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely wouldn't disagree with you. I, I think though, and this kind of got into our, um, we got into this in our debate. I'm sort of a big believer with the existentialists that existence precedes essence. So what happens in physical reality tends to have a much more uh, impactful, um, uh, I guess, it impacts the world to a slightly greater degree than what happens in mental reality. Now, interestingly enough, the philosophy comes back around and in Buddhism, we would say that the physical and the mental actually aren't different. They just appear to be. So you, to, in a long drawn out way, I think you're right. I think they're both important. Interesting. Um, so how, how then, so that was during your atheist days. Cause I remember the Occupy Wall Street movement, mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street. And I considered them to be like the scum of the earth. It was like a, <laughs> it was a reaction, in my opinion, but maybe not, yeah. to the Tea Party thing that took place after Obama started doing the bailouts and stuff. And so oh. you participated in that. Mm -hmm. Where? Yeah, yeah. In Wall Street or in Oakland or where? Yeah, Zuc Zuccotti Park, New York. Okay. I was there uh, starting about, I think, two, three weeks in. It was r right after the a uh, bunch of my friends got arrested um, on the Brooklyn Bridge. 2011, was, 2010? What was it? Uh, that, that would have been 2011. Okay. That would have been, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, Occupy, it's really funny that you kind of put us out as a <laughs> reaction to the Tea Party movement. Because uh -huh. first off, we had a ton of Tea Party people at Occupy. Like there was a whole right libertarian, okay. like American capital L libertarian contingent at Occupy um, that I frequently argued with, but I still have friends from. Um, I know the Democrats really, and, and the liberal media for a while really wanted us to be the Democrat version right. of the Tea Party, but we told them to take a hike. Um, and Occupy really formed in reaction to the fact that, you know, the banks had crashed our economy and no one went to jail. Yeah. Every single one of the people that did that got away with it scot-free, except for like, I think one guy, because he, he like an idiot, he pled guilty to the crimes he'd actually done and served some time for it. But I mean, that was really what Occ Occupy was about a lot of stuff. But, you know, on the ground, that was really like the major catalyzing thing for us was that these people had destroyed our economy, um, cost, you know, lives and jobs and houses, and they got away with a, a slap on the wrist. It was, and, and even not a slap on the wrist, sometimes they benefited from it. A lot of them really did. I mean, what was it Lloyd Blankfein became Obama's like financial advisor? So, and Goldman Sachs was huge in, involved in like the actual problem that had led to the crash of 2008. So yeah, I think Occupy in a lot of ways uh, was definitely not an attempt at making a uh, Democrat version of the Tea Party. But if it, it, what's odd is that if we had not told the Democrats to take a hike, we might still be around. <laughs> right. Because, uh, you know, they destroyed us after that. Interesting. They, um, I remember they would say that we are the 99% and it was the, mm -hmm. the semi well to do and the so called poor versus the ultra rich. Mm -hmm. Although it seemed to be kind of selective about who they really went after. <laughs> um, I, get, I mean, at least in my perception. Uh, well, but I mean, it depends. Don't you have to blame the people for electing these corrupt people and and participating in a, a corrupt culture that brought you about know, these people at the top who were corrupt? It, 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 to some extent, yes, but also, and I, I pointed this out actually when um, uh, I, I put out a video just before um, the election uh, of um, uh, before the twenty uh, the, before the election of Biden. 
Um, and I said, because there was a lot of stuff going around about the morality of voting. And there were a lot of people on the left trying to shame people into voting who didn't want to vote for Biden into voting for Biden. Um, and, and saying it was immoral to vote for Donald Trump or to not vote for Biden. Um, I don't really think moral accountability can really be assigned if what that person has done would have had a different, uh, would not have had a different outcome. So like, for instance, the, the classic example of this is you're driving a car and unknown to you, someone has cut your brakes and you're coming up to a stop site and you know, like a kid runs out in front of you and you slam on the brakes, but oh, nothing happens and you hit the kid. Are you responsible for hitting that kid? No, the person who cut your brakes is responsible for hitting that kid. You, the way you acted in that situation had no effect on the outcome and therefore you have no moral accountability. And the thing is, is like in a national election, it doesn't matter who pretty much anybody votes for. Like, you know, I live in New York. Uh, so like if I vote uh, the first time around with like Hillary Clinton um, at, versus Trump, I voted for um, the only way that my vote would count is I voted for Gary Johnson. Did I like Gary Johnson? No, but I hated the two party system more. And the fact is, is that no matter what I did or how I voted, the um, like New York was always going to be blue. You know, so and 100 percent of the electoral votes would go to, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton. So do do the voters actually have a say? No, we really don't. Um, and, and we have sort of an illusion in a big national election like that. Now, yeah. it gets a little different when you get down to, like, I, I guess, uh, local politics, because right. the, the more your vote matters, the more moral accountability you have. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I really don't think that the American democracy is a real democracy. There are so many checks and balances on it that seem to be that, that, we've, that we've been told are for our own good. But I don't really believe that at this point. I think it's more for the good of the people that are in charge. And I would prefer the power to actually be in the hands of, you know, everyday ordinary Americans as much as possible. Last question about the uh, Occupy stuff. I remember sure. having this impression that they were pretty degenerate they were they would leave the you know the me mainstream media would say at least Fox News said that you guys would leave trash everywhere and that there were rapes and stuff like that were in your atheist days in the Occupy movement <laughs> did you pick up after yourself absolutely you know it was really funny too so first off, um, I, I won't say that bad stuff didn't happen at Occupy because it was a subset of the world and bad stuff happens in the world. Um, but you got to understand, first off, the park was clean. Um, in fact, we had a working group dedicated to keeping the park clean. And I had just run a fundraiser at the Yippie Museum in New York to raise money and to buy supplies to keep the park clean, like the day before Bloomberg raided Zuccotti Park. And you know, you remember when Bloomberg like sent his stormtroopers out, they did it in the middle of the night. Uh, they dispatched police helicopters oh, you to prevent coverage out, from the huh? air. Overnight. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I wasn't, but there were people there. I had yeah. an apartment. Um, but there were a lot of people camping out there. Um, and, you know, under the pretext of supposedly cleaning the park, but this was a lie. Like, I mean, yeah, there's a bunch of hippies there. Hippies are sometimes dirty, but like the idea that uh, we were degenerates, and I want to drill into that. I want to know what you mean by degenerate. Um, I think it's ridiculous. And also, like, a lot of the time, People, the cops were sending actual infiltrators down there to cause problems. I can uh, believe that. There were a number of NYPD police officers who would find drunk people or heroin addicts and stuff and send them to Zakati so that they would later have the excuse to attack. Yeah, I could believe that. It's basically, in my opinion, evil people fighting evil people because Bloomberg is no good, nor. Nor are the I mean, leadership Bloomberg's of definitely the... not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are you? Are you Italian? What are you that you Me? were raised Catholic and all that? Yeah. Oh, I, I'm so um, I am about the the whitest person you will ever encounter. Like uh, my family were peasants in the Carpathian Mountains. <laughs> um, and like I, I, I where's was that? Uh, where's Carpathian the Carpathian Mountains? Mountains? Uh -huh. It's between like Poland and Russia, kind of on the border near the, the, the Caucasus. Um, I think my I was I was born in Italy um, to uh, as a Navy brat, actually, um, and raised in like Pennsylvania and Virginia and Kentucky, you know, moved okay. around a lot as a kid. Um, 
but uh, yeah, so like, I guess my background is Eastern European. I'm basically a Dracula, um, but okay. like culturally, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a mix. It's a very American story. <laughs> Why the long hair? Are you into metal or it, what does it have? What is what is it? I, I mean, I've always loved long hair. I think it looks cool. Um, and um, like uh, I grew my hair long when I hiked the Appalachian Trail and that uh, symbolized a major change in my life. When was uh, and it I haven't that you did that? yet experienced a life changing event like the Appalachian Trail. So, I, you know, I've kept it going. <laughs> when did you when did you hike that? Uh, that was 2008, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I so I did the first 600 miles, uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee to Waynesboro, Virginia, uh, just as I was finishing college, um, then uh, in like 2006. Um, then I went back, I finished college, I worked for two years, uh, had a personal tragedy and did the remaining, you know, um, 1800 miles. Um, yeah, starting May to uh, November uh, 2008, just before uh -huh. I moved to New York. What did your parents think about you turning atheist and then Buddhist? Um, I mean, my mom, I, I, so I was raised to be a little heathen, <laughs> you know, I remember when I was a kid, uh, my mom read me the story of Abraham and Isaac and was horrified by it. Um, you were, and, uh, so you, were you were horrified by Abraham being, told no, my to mom Isaac. was horrified. By oh, she it. was the idea. Oh, yeah. Okay. This, and you know, if you think about it, that's a terrible thing to do to a parent, I'm a parent and the idea of somebody commanding me to kill my kid is, 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 yeah, it's absolutely horrifying. So, you know, um, I spent time, you know, I was raised Catholic, but I was also taught to think for myself. Um, and, uh, you know, I think my parents were less in, were, were less inclined to me being an atheist. They, they've been more supportive of me being a Buddhist, uh, cause they can see that I'm a lot happier, uh, than I was as an atheist. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, overall, they've been very supportive of me just finding my own way. Okay. Your father was in the home, too, when you were growing up? They were married? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they're still they're still married and everything. <laughs> I forgot that you're you're married. I didn't I don't know if I knew that you were a father. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm married. I have a three year old son. Okay. And you married since being a Buddhist or since being an atheist? I mean, I married. Uh, I was a Buddhist <laughs> at the time I married. Okay. All um, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, a white or an Asian or what? Just out of curiosity, you don't have to say that that's one. a very weird question, but <laughs> my wife is white. Okay. I, I don't know how that's uh, relevant, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just interesting to me. Yeah. It's people's interactions. Yeah. And you grew up in New York area? No, no. Uh, oh, I, yeah, I spent... you said you where you grew up. You grew up all over. Yeah, I, I grew up all over. It's, I, I really like, you know, like, uh, Italy to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania to Virginia, Virginia to Kentucky, Kentucky to Ohio, Ohio to Kentucky again. Then I hiked the Appalachian Trail, Maine to Georgia, and you know moved to Harlem in, in okay. New York. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, on to what's going on today. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the uh, vaccine mandates? There's a big. There's a big. A big push for over it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think overall people should get the vaccine. I think that it's proven effective. Um, and it matters a lot to me because my wife is immunocompromised. Um, and like, if she gets COVID, she could die and my son could lose his mother. Um, and you know, she's vaccinated as well, but it doesn't work as well on, uh, immunocompromised people. So, you know, that's really, really important to me. That said, I, I don't like the idea of mandates. Uh, well, one, I'm an anarchist, so I oppose the state, uh, you know, um, but on top of that, like, I don't like the idea of mandates because like, okay, if we could mandate that people get the vaccine and we know that it would help them, you know, that would be one thing, but actually implementing that and putting state power behind it, one, it's going to scare people and make them think that, oh, there's definitely something awful in these vaccines if they're forcing us to get it. Yeah. Uh, and, and two, I don't trust the state to actually administer that like fairly. I, I Instead, I see them using it kind of like how the cops used their lies about the park being dirty. Uh, I use I see them using that for their own ends, yeah. you know, to to perpetuate their own power and to abuse who they want to abuse. So uh, as, as much as I think that you absolutely should get the vaccine, 
um, like uh, you, it shouldn't, it should not be forced. It should be incentivized in a positive way, as opposed to, um, you, you know, some sort of uh, legal mandate. In 2016, you said you voted for G Gary Johnson over there mm -hmm. in New York. In yeah. 2020, whom did you vote for, if you don't mind my asking? Oh, I, I voted for Biden. Okay. <laughs> I, I have a deep, it's, I have a deep, yeah, I, I did a debate about this, but like, and in my video, like I have a deep hatred for Donald Trump. Like he, even before he was a political figure, but like you, you ever see like a movie where like a cat sees a vampire and hisses at it. That is how I react. Donald Trump is the vampire. I'm the cat. <laughs> so you've felt that way ever since even like Home Alone 2 when he made that cameo yeah. appearance. I like have him. thought he I have thought he is a absolutely vapid um effete idiot who has no business doing anything in our society uh, let alone you know commanding our our military and police um you know I I think like it's one of the it was one of the most disheartening things that I ever saw in our, the entire history of our country and like you know I used to when I was young I used to be a Republican like up until, you know, the disaster of the Iraq war, uh, I was really, really behind, you know, traditional conservative Republican values. Your parents? And I think, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. My, my, my dad, uh, yeah, <laughs> big, big time Republican. Um, but like, the, the thing is, is that I think even I, I went back and I thought of myself when I was 18. And I was really into the into the GOP and thinking I might be part of the young GOP. And I thought, would I have liked Donald Trump back then? And I think, no, I think I would have thought he was an absolute idiot. <laughs> Interesting. So, and in fact, yeah. You, uh, so, mm -hmm. as now you're a Buddhist, though, and you believe in God, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to be hating Donald Trump, right? Uh, I That's mean, not loving kindness. <laughs> I heard that Buddhists are into loving kindness. We are. And so when I when I talk about hating, uh, I'm talking about a visceral emotional reaction. Um, <laughs> Buddhism, and you don't think you can help it? Um, well, to, to a certain extent, like, in, so the way Buddhism thinks of emotion uh, is in the way that like a lake reflects a bird passing over. The lake reflects the bird and then it lets it go when it's time, you know, when the bird has moved on, it doesn't hold on to it. It doesn't get stuck in, on it or hung up on it. So when we talk about emotions, uh, oftentimes I think of emotions in the sense of like a storm, a storm comes, you experience it. This is a storm and then it leaves uh, and you're still here. So it's like emotions are like hatred, love, it, it, it's changes in the weather. So your but your emotions have not towards Donald Trump specifically have not really changed over time. I'm not no. I mean I, <laughs> now that he's not president, not causing problems as much anymore. I'm not as angry with him as I used to be. Um, I still I, I have a lot of compassion for him as well at times because like I imagine being him and the the thought of being in his head is actually kind of terrifying to me. <laughs> like so I'm like. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's this part of you that wants to punish someone for doing evil, as you see it, but then also you kind of realize that to be them is kind of punishment enough almost. Um, I felt that his presidency was so refreshing. When he came on the scene, he told mm -hmm. the truth in a way. He was uh, kind of a, an affront to the establishment in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. He told the truth that was... You know, they would sh try to shame him and accuse him of lying when he told mm -hmm. th said things that were true and he stood by it. And that was so refreshing. And he expressed goodwill towards everybody, including the illegals that he wants to deport. You know, he's like a, just a man of love and humility. That I mean, was... I don't think you can possibly characterize <laughs> Donald Trump as a man of humility. <laughs> like Why the not? dude lives in a freaking golden palace in in New York. There's there's nothing humble about that. But he knows how um, to market himself. He but does. I, I'll give him that. He's that. That's one of his absolute talents. He's also very um, uh, charismatic. You can tell, like when you listen to his speeches and stuff, and when you watch the way he talks to people. Do you yeah, think? He, that, that, do you think he doesn't hmm? mean what he says when he says? The controversial I, things, let's say. I would say Donald Trump says whatever he thinks people want to hear and will get him the most love and adoration in the moment. But I he's better he at that any... than politicians. I think politicians 
try to well, do yeah. that, right? But he's <laughs> he, he's actually comes off genuine. Well, of course Go he on. does. Bec- yeah, no. So here's the thing. Like, if you look into his history, his father was an absolute monster who didn't love him. And like, <laughs> I really think that hole and that abuse from Fred Trump to, to Donald Trump left him with this kind of emptiness inside that he needs adoration to fill. That's what led him to live the life that he lives, to, you know, reach the heights of power that he that he reached. And, um, you know, it's really tragic also because that that hole that's in him, it can't be filled by any kind of outside um uh, you could you could become the president of the United States. You could rule for a thousand years. Your name could be, and you will never fill that hole because he's looking in the wrong place for it. Uh, that kind of love and contentment can only be cultivated internally. It's one of the things that you know Buddhism is really good at, um, and that I think he would probably benefit from Buddhist practice. Um, so, like, yeah, I mean, you thought that I his think- father didn't didn't love him and that he oh, was he not, definitely did and that he was insecure you felt that trump was insecure intensely insecure you you can't behave like that if you're not insecure he seems like, the most mm-hmm. secure like look at him well, he, remember him <laughs> on stage with this i don't know if you watched the republican primary debate the first yeah. one him versus the 16 or 17 other republicans mm-hmm. it was like a man among boys he was just being real and all these yeah. phony politicians being phony well, I think I don't think he was being real. I think he was just better at hiding, um, you know, uh, what he was. Than <laughs> what made these you other think career politicians? What makes you think his father didn't love him? Um, there's a if you look into like the biography of like the way Fred Trump treated his children, um, I, I I can't recall now because I've read a number of articles on it. Um, like he and the father, for instance, tortured his older brother. Like um, the the older brother wanted to become a pilot and the uh, uh, and, and like Fred Trump thought that this was all this is like, what's the difference between you and a bus driver that because you can fly planes, you know, um, <laughs> he said because, that. <laughs> yeah, because the older brother didn't want to be exactly like Fred Trump, you know, um, he was squeezed out. Uh, and Donald Trump became like the new scion, uh, the guy made in his father's image. Uh, his father also, if I recall, um, like uh, sent him to uh, military school. Uh, also, like ha- there were some behavioral problems before he was sent there. Um, something I recall a story involving Donald Trump in Queens, like doing normal kid shit. Like I think he like went out and like bought like a uh, bought like a knife or something as like a, a, a preteen and got got you know, the hammer laid down on him pretty heavily by his father. (laughs) So like, yeah, I mean, that stuff doesn't sound so bad to me. I mean, it's kind of, it's yeah. Anyway. Well, I mean, they tortured the older brother till he drank himself to death. Like, yeah, I remember, I remember Trump saying that he would, I mean, he doesn't drink to this day, basically, mm-hmm. because his, yeah. his brother died of alcoholism. To this day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the fact is, is that he had a hand in his brother's death, I think. So, like, like if you've got a family that the kid's sin is he wanted to be different and do something different than, than the father, and you treat him so poorly that he drinks himself to death, that's not a healthy family dynamic. I'm sorry. Like, you, you know, a family needs to support uh, and uphold each other and, you know, help each other through hard times. And I, I didn't see that. And I don't think you could see that in, you know, with the sort of like upper class New York socialite, um, you know, uh, I guess, uh, family dynamic that is so common in, in these types of people who've reached these heights of power. Interesting. You guys can call in. Oh, I don't have it on screen. 888-775-3773. I just have a couple of questions left for you, but I have some uh, super chats for you. People uh, can super chat to me. And let's see this first one. Lin Yen Chin, a faithful viewer of The Hake Report, over there on streamlabs.com slash The Hake Report. The number is on the screen. 888 775-3773. Seven seven five three seven seven three. But Lin Yen Shin says, "Please ask Brenton why he chose the path of rejecting common sense as anecdotal and untrustworthy in the face of facts, when facts are all just axiomatic extrapolation about that which is taken to be self-evident, aka opinion of the observer." Did you follow that? Want me to read again? 
Yeah, I followed it. Um, so uh, what was her name? Lin Yen Chin. It's a young man. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> so, so Lin, um, here's the problem with that argument you just made is circular. Because you essentially said, why did I reject opinions, um, like personal opinions and anecdotes based upon facts, which are just opinions? So you're asking why I rejected opinions based upon uh, and not in favor of other opinions. So personal experience. He said common sense. He said common common sense. sense. Okay. Well, okay. So common sense is just the old way of thinking from a previous society like that gets instilled in us as we grow up like our current common sense is based upon like the the expert 19th century scientists opinion which a lot of which was wrong and similarly like in the 1900s their common sense was based upon the the similar like things in the in the 1800s so common sense a lot of the time it, it, it's not so much truth as it is ideology that people don't recognize as, as ideology. Um, and we have to be very careful about that. I, I think it's important that we don't deceive ourselves and that we see actual reality. So if someone's giving a common sense response um, or they are giving an anecdotal response, you, you can take that with a certain amount of uh, veracity. There's something there, but we know that's not true in either in either situation. Similarly, like, when you, we've got these um, uh, established ways of finding truth, the scientific method, statistical analysis, that kind of thing. Um, these are coping mechanisms that we have created as humans to try to help us again interact with reality. And I really think what you should do is take all three of these into consideration and come to a conclusion based upon all of them together. But I think in general, if this if the statistics and um, scientific method have been done properly, uh, and if uh, the, the, you are in a position where you can actually uh, interpret them, I think they should be given greater weight than one person's opinion or experience or feeling of um, common sense, because that's just more people involved. You know, you get more heads together, you can suss out the truth and have more perspectives otherwise. I don't know if that's true. I remember you, um, when you were debating uh, about Black Lives Matter, if they've done more harm mm-hmm. than good on a prior debate on Modern Day Debate, and I was super mm-hmm. chatting in, Yeah. Um, you said that there's lies, there's dang lies, <laughs> And then there's, there's lies, statistics. there's damn liars and statisticians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which and I heard so, from my statistics professor in college, by the way. <laughs> right, because people and even and large groups mm-hmm. of people are not trustworthy in putting out the truth, even including experts themselves. Well, I mean, they're not always trustworthy. I just think like in general, it can be more trustworthy. But yes, I mean, statistics can be miscarried. It's yeah. very, very easy to trick people with yeah. statistics. Uh, and, you know, that's also why you want to be very careful when you're dealing with like a heavily partisan source. It doesn't mean that they're lying necessarily, but you should be really, really careful, especially if they try to give you like one or two little facts where you can try to draw big conclusions. from. So, so like, for instance, um, like that 1350 meme where 13% uh, of the population commits 50% of the murders referring to black crime. What's up modern day debate? I see modern day debate in the chat. Yeah. Anyway. So, so that I I say frequently that saying that, and then putting that forth as a fact, it may be a true statistic, but asserting the conclusions people draw from it are about as dumb as saying the average American has one breast and one testicle. Because, you know, American population is 50% female, 50 for 50% male, average them together. Women have two breasts mostly and, you know, no testicles and men have two testicles, no breasts. So average American, st- true to statistical fact, one breast and one testicle. So you can draw a true statistical fact that is also a complete and utter lie. Um, and, and, and similarly, so, like you have the same issue with the 1350. So what is the lie about 1350, what's like a common lie about mm-hmm. 13% of the population commits 50%, 50% of, the of the violent crime? Well, there's a number of problems with it. Uh, and we kind of went over this, like, and I don't want to do a deep dive into this because this would take hours, but essentially when you control for poverty, that 
uh, disappears, essentially. The fact is, is that murders are more likely to be committed by poor people. Um, and there's no real difference between switching from rural to urban. So you put people in a pressure cooker where they're under a lot of stress from not having enough money, not having enough food, not having access to medical care, that kind of thing. A lot of them are unfortunately going to act out and that will be violent. Um, and we've seen this. Uh, so in controlling for poverty, and controlling for the fact that more black people have been forced into and kept in poverty compared to the white population, um, we find that these are more or less equivalent. Uh, we also have instances, for instance, that, um, and I mentioned this in our debate, that uh, seven for, so seven, there are seven times the rate of innocent black people who are convicted of uh, murder uh, compared to white people. So for every one innocent white person con convicted of murder and sent to prison, there are seven innocent black people, uh, black men who are convicted and sent to prison. So like it, it, when you try to boil it down to those basic statistics, it's, it can sound very persuasive to people, but it, it's it, ultimately like if you understand statistical analysis uh, and if you look deeply into these issues, you realize it's, it's, it's a mirage. So it's, fa so it's a fact, but it's, mm -hmm. But you're saying that it's the reason it, for it is somebody else's fault. They're being victimized by being kept in poverty. And in your mind, poverty causes crime. No, it, I mean, poverty does cause crime. No, it, it doesn't. Well, not exactly. So, so poverty, yeah. it, it's not just poverty that causes crime. It is po like, because if you have a society what? where everyone is equally poor, they're not likely to steal from each other. It, it's like when you have a society where some people are poor and some people are very wealthy and you put them near each other, then suddenly crime starts to happen. Um, you know, and I, I, there's a number of reasons behind that. But yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, there's a there is a cultural problem, a morality problem. And that's what's causing the, those people to be so-called poor. And it's mm -hmm. also what's causing them to be committing crimes. I mean, I won't say that there's not a- And they're encouraged you know, to feel like mm -hmm. victims, which as you know, that just causes, victims become perpetrators. Yeah, so we kind of talked about this and I don't want to rehash our, uh -huh. our uh, previous argument. Um, but what I'll just say is, people oftentimes uh, will adopt ideologies that make sense to them in the moment. Um, you know, a, a person's ideology and a person's thoughts can oftentimes be an expression of how they feel and what is most convenient for them in the world or just the way they see things at that time. So if you're looking at um, somebody having poor values. One of the things you can do to change those values is to change uh, their environment. And when the environment changes, the values change with it. Um, and the experience of being a person often changes with it. It's a, it's a tough thing to do because essentially you're, you're sort of the, the, you know, the snake with both sides. Is it which way is the snake really moving? It's both simultaneously. Um, but yeah, so it, with, without getting too into the weeds on that, right. I think like you, you invest in these communities, raise their quality of life, um, clean, up the, clean up the neighborhood, and you're going to see people uh, you know, behave in a much more positive way because they're not under so much stress. And I that have, would do away with the bad values. I have a couple of more super chats for you and some calls if you have time. Mm -hmm. We yeah, have yeah, about sure. 10 minutes till the top of the hour, but hopefully maybe we can go over. Yeah, I um, can go over. This is fun. Bibby42 with a super chat on streamlabs.com slash the Hake Report says, good to see Brenton on the Hake Report. You guys had an awesome debate over there on Modern Day Debate. Shout out. Mm -hmm. I may not agree with Brenton on anything, but he seems nice and respectful. I wish him well. <laughs> Thanks very much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Bibby42. Hydro gave a super chat. Says, your guest Brenton sounds and laughs like Marxist Ben Burgess. Ben Burgess. <laughs> You're a friend of his, right? Okay, I don't think I laugh like Ben Burgess. Ben Burgess and I are friends. Uh, he is a Marxist. I am not. Um, but, like, uh, I, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> you, uh, Ben Burgess has appeared on the Hake Report over a year ago. Uh, nice. Anyway, let me get to uh, let me get to a call. Jonathan in uh, California wants to talk about the Brenton saying that Trump tortured his brother or the father yeah. did something. Jonathan, are you there? Hey, how's hey, it going? <laughs> going well. Go for it. Cool. Um, all right. Um, are you on yeah, speaker? Just, it's coming uh, in. No, I just took it off. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Whoa. Whoa. You okay, okay. man? Sorry. <laughs> I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> um, so I just, so did you know that um, uh, every day uh, Trump's brother uh, told him uh, to never drink and never smoke and never do drugs? I mean, I I'm, wouldn't be surprised. Well, does that sound like somebody who was torturing him? Like, why I mean, would that not surprise you? Because you thought that Trump was torturing him to death. So you I mean, think I that he would that do something so nice to somebody who was torturing him to death? Well, you know yeah. what I mean? Why I would mean, he be he... so nice as to give him that advice if he was torturing him, him to death? Yeah, dude, it's his brother. It's family. And, you know, we as humans have a very strong instinct towards our family. We love our family <laughs> members oftentimes, you know, when they are behaving in monstrous ways. Um, and, you know, yeah. like even when you have a contentious relationship with someone, that's not all it is. Humans are complicated, you know? So sometimes we, we don't always okay. act in ways that an outside observer might expect because they're, they're, they're not, they're not us. They're not inside our head. I know if I had a really bad relationship with my brother and I wanted it to be a good relationship, uh, you know, maybe I might genuinely try to help him, um, you know, and maybe that would be returned. Maybe it wouldn't. And then, so Trump like followed his, his advice. Too, mm -hmm. So he'd be more likely to follow the advice of somebody who he hated enough to torture to death. I mean, again, yeah, these, these it are just siblings. sounds like he got a little bit of confirmation bias, man. You know what I mean? I mean, like, and I would not put it past that Soka Gakai thing to give you a bit of narcissism, mm -hmm. right? Because you just <laughs> like <chant. laughs> no, so definitely yeah. not. With so so, this is very important <laughs> as far as like narcissism goes in Buddhism. Uh, like we hold that. The, the self doesn't actually exist. So like it's, it's pretty much the absolute opposite of narcissism. Like I don't think so. That, when you're chanting non yo ho renge kyo every morning, yeah. right? When you're doing <laughs> that, even. you're supposed to be like uh, imagining what you want in your life. Right. That's part of the meditation. Um, so yeah, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, uh, which is the title of the Lotus Sutra, which is the central sutra for my text, um, especially early on when you first start chanting, you want to uh, oftentimes part like of the meditation Picture what you exercise. want in your life. Try to manifest um, it by like yeah, picturing yeah. it while you're chanting, right? That's kind of- That idea. is, that is, yeah, that's something that er, that practitioners do, but it's something that you do to actually get past your ego. Uh, in the same way that people could use like the gravitational pull of Earth to launch something like a satellite. It's saying, it's saying mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to imagine something into my life. That's getting over mm -hmm. your ego? Because I mean, that sounds it's, like it's giving you an ego to say like, all mm -hmm. I got to do is close my eyes and repeat this. <laughs> Chance, and well, first I'm off, I'm going to be able yeah. to manifest this thing. Mm -hmm. had, so, so first off, that's I've not, that's not what with these yeah. people, and they're all narcissists, man. They're I all mean, narcissists. I, I, that's they're so. Here's God. the thing: you're playing God, technically. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, I'm so, going to be able to manifest whatever the heck I want in my life. That's crazy. That's got nothing to do with being still, man. I didn't know that yeah. about uh, the mm -hmm. Buddhism thing. I didn't know that. You guys did that. There's a it's yeah, a meditation they like this like altar thing that's supposed to be like the, the mirror of zone. their life. Mm -hmm. The uh, but so, they got a shaka. But how many people have you shaka buku? Shaka buku? Uh, I mean, shaka buku <laughs> is just talking, talking about it. Buddhism no with someone. So I don't know. I don't keep track. <laughs> is of that it. <laughs> is that like voodoo doll? No, mm -hmm. no. It's it's a term be, for. You're supposed yeah. to be doing the whole uh, mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witness thing. You got a shaka buku. It's like oh, convert, you have you convert to get people? people to join. This the is cult. a this yeah, is yeah. a th this is a complete misrepresentation of uh, what no, it actually not, is. Shaka buku is to, sometimes turn people the whole talk world into they're try, they're all about like world domination, man. Okay, they're all, world all right, <laughs> all right, Jonathan. Let me let me hear him. Let me him. Yeah, no, hear him respond. You're going completely off the rails there. So shakabuku right. is a term It goes back in Buddhism to debate. And it, it was originally done like among monks where they would involve the themselves debate. in debates oh, about the sutras. Um, oh, sometimes yeah. people will use shakabuku, like you will see uh, SGI sometimes will use shakabuku in the sense of like witnessing to people. And, you know, that is something that people do. Uh, I think that's a more narrow use of the term. Um, we definitely do talk about Buddhism a lot because it's been a positive influence on our life and we want to help other people. 
So yeah, well, I mean, the, I've mm-hmm. been to the, I've been to the meetings, man. You got shakabuku mm-hmm. Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, I got shakabuku Yeah. <laughs> did, I, did you receive I, a gohonzo? I was working for, yeah, I got a gohonzo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, great. I was working, I was working for a guy who was like, you have to join this religion or I'm not going to give you any hours. <laughs> nice. Oh my God. Really? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's horrifying. You, okay. <laughs> yeah. So first off, if that happens, you need to immediately like report that both to his, his superiors in Sokogakai because that's incredibly abusive. And second of yeah, all, you need to also to, like, report that, people. like put in a labor complaint, man. Cause like, that's something yeah. that is your boss forcing a religion on you. Right. Yeah. Well, it wasn't so like black and white. It was just kind of like a, you know, like it was a unspoken. hit hit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, even you really should go to HR with that kind of complaint. Like that is that is not cool HR, for a boss to do. I mean, you, uh, it's there; it exists. I assure you. No, <laughs> there is HR, HR for the do. religion. <laughs> no, he's talking about for the for your job. Discrimin- for your job, yeah, yeah. yeah. religious a, discrimination. He was a contractor, so it was like you know, it was the independent sort of thing. Mm. But, well, but, what what yeah. I'd say is like, yeah, that I'm sorry that happened to you. That you know, and I should add, by the way, I'm Thanks, not a man. spokesman for Soka Gakai. I'm a yeah, former no, men's you seem leader. You like a kind of nice thing. guy, man. Mm-hmm. You seem, and I, I do have respect how you. I mean, because like, whenever you get somebody from you know who's willing to debate and then be respectful and actually hear the other person and not like, you mm-hmm. know, just do all the sure. bad. You know, you're good at this, so I, I respect yeah. that. I appreciate well, it, you. Jonathan. Uh, so yeah. I, I do, I do yeah. want to correct something, though, because I, this is this is a popular misconception about um, chanting the Gohan Zone. People think it's like the secret. And if you if you chant to the Gohan Zone, yeah. you will get That's material things like. in your life. So first That's off, really- um, there is a meditation technique that you do where you chant and focus on material things. But that is actually part, part of transcending your ego, because there is a way of meditating where you try to think about like, embrace the idea that you are selfish and you only care about yourself and follow that like as far down the rabbit hole as you really can. Okay. I really only care about myself. So what is it that I want? I want wine, women, and song. Wait a minute. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Now now here, but, but yeah, but here's the thing. You follow that down. What do you find? You, you don't actually Uh, love yourself when you do that. You love everything that is not you. You want the wine to, okay. to drink it. You want the women because they're not you. And suddenly, uh-oh, I can't like love myself because I love all of this other stuff. But if I actually do love all of this other stuff, suddenly there's a polarity between you and the external world. That is what that meditation is supposed to teach. Right. Um, but like you're, you're, you're at like the baby's steps at the very beginning. So I, I gave away the ending there. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank Take you, care. Hey. All right. Awesome stuff. You <laughs> Interesting. <too. laughs> All right. Chanting Namiho Renge Kyo to the Gohan Zone can feel like magic. And I, I found my life has improved since I embraced that Buddhist practice, but it's not magic. You know, okay. I'm just I'm just doing it. And anything that I actually do in my life is still stuff that I have done. It's just come about as uh, because I'm in a better headspace. I guess that's partly why I asked if you had an Asian <laughs> wife is because you got oh. into the Buddhism thing, even though it's more Indian, but the Asians embraced it. Mm-hmm. And the well, Asians... Yeah, no. Well, Mm -hmm. the Chinese, like, they fell for the Buddhism thing, which is Indian, and they also Mm -hmm. fell for the Marxism thing, which is not even Chinese, but they're, like, communists now. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's not... So, the reason Marxism became widely adopted in China was because China was the focus of, like, a uh, inhuman level of colonial abuse, and Marxism at the time was seen as a way to throw off the yoke of colonial oppressors and build your uh, your own society on your own terms. Um, and, you know, in some ways that really succeeded. China is an economic powerhouse today. The Soviet Union went from, you know, a limping pre-industrial power uh, that was still s- semi-feudal to a superpower capable of destroying the, nat- the Nazi war machine and going toe-to-toe with the United States in a matter of decades. Now, there was a massive human cost to what they did. I don't think that model is a good model, uh, particularly not moving forward. But I mean, yeah, obviously Marxism is going to be something that people are going to embrace when they feel the essentially the colonial boot heel coming from the West. Wow. It's their way to fight back. (laughs) A quick super chat. Asmodore, 
over there on Odyssey, O-D-Y-S-E-E dot com slash at the Hague Report slash live. It says 13 to 50 obviously means blacks commit half the murders. From this, we can conclude they're more likely to commit murder. Your guest nope. is your guest <laughs> you got the is first just, one, but you don't have the second one. Your guest is just making excuses. White Appalachians are poorer than urban blacks and don't commit murder at these rates. Oh, dude. No, you have no idea. Like, seriously. And I actually even pointed that out in our debate when you were like, there's no poverty in the United States. I'm like, have you seen Appalachia? Like, uh, th- there was a freaking so kid. They're, so in, they're murderous up there in Appalachia? Appalachia? Anywhere there is extreme poverty, you see a huge rise in murders and also in police killings. Correlation um, is not causation. Yeah. No, certainly not. Uh, and it takes a lot to understand causation. But again, you put people in a pressure cooker, they're going to act out. Um, but the people put themselves yeah. in this. But I mean, like, yeah, I mean, th- there's that whole, uh, like, people are uh, afraid of rednecks, <laughs> specifically because, like, and especially in the mountains, you know, th- there has been a lot of uh, crime and, and murders uh, related to that. I mean, especially during, like, Prohibition, there it was huge with, like, you talk about, like, the old whiskey stills and the shootouts. Um, you know, there was, a, even even today, like, with the opioid epidemic, I mean, there was a kid I went to high school with, I know there's still, um, there's still flyers around our old Kentucky town, have you seen this missing adult? And I guarantee you, like, that, he, he's dead in a field somewhere because of, he, he got involved in drugs. And why did he get involved in drugs? Because there's a ton of poverty, and that's one of the only ways you can make money uh, in in uh, you know poor uh, you know poor communities, whether they be urban or um, uh, urban or rural. Huh. All right. All right. We'll have to see. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting. I would have to have. But- you would have to look into the statistics. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Azador says he's written extensively about this issue, mm-hmm. and so he, dif- he uh, begs to differ. Yeah, but, I'm uh, not familiar with the author. I can't speak one way or the other. Okay. Uh, another super chat. Single mom doing her best says, how are you going to blame Trump's dad for someone else's drinking? He can't control how someone else chooses to deal with their insecurities. I mean, in the same way that I would blame uh, a, a manager whose team fails or a commander whose, um, you know, soldiers die, uh, you know, when you are in a position of authority, the buck stops at you. And, you know, as a father, if you knowingly or unknowingly create a toxic environment for your kid, same thing as a mother or whatever, you know, that's your fault. And you have a hand in their fate. You don't completely control it because their actions are not your actions. And sometimes you do the best and bad stuff still happens. But yeah, no, there's absolutely uh, the primary responsibility for a child that turns out poorly it falls flatly on their parents. Okay. Um, unless there's something out, some other uh, extenuating circumstance. I got another, I've got a few more calls. I hope you can stay. Yeah, yeah I can stay around. Yeah. Uh, Joe from Phoenix, Arizona wants to talk about the 13% causing 50%. Joe, thank you for holding. Your, your viewers are very hung up on this. So <laughs> continue, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Good morning, Brenton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the 1350 stat is complete and total BS, and Asmodor is a complete idiot as usual. <laughs> now, the F- the FBI stats show what, approximately 1.2 million murders per year. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, about half of those are committed by by black criminals. So that's about 600,000, right? So you so, said that it's BS, uh, but it's true. No, Bogus just speech. listen, James. Go ahead. So it so it's 1.05 percent of black people that commit violent crimes, murder, aggravated assault, rape, um, negligent homicide is what the FBI tracks. So it's a tiny, tiny percentage of black folks. It says nothing about black folks the same way that the white folks who commit the most white-collar crimes on Wall Street says nothing about most white folks. I've heard that yes. that's says, actually says not nothing. true. What do you According mean? The this FBI, whole, this whole yeah. white-collar crime thing, when you compare mm-hmm. to the number of people the percentage of the different populations, the demographics of those in the white collar world, the blacks are still more likely to commit the white collar crime. Uh, wrong, wrong again, James. The no, FBI I've, says I've looked that. into it. Hang on, he, he, had, he had a bigger point here, though. Go ahead. Where he was saying, like, anyway, these I interrupted murders, you. Yeah, go ahead. You know, it's 1% yeah, well, less than 1%. Right? We'll deal with your white collar stuff criminal. later. 
Yeah. The FBI says the average white collar criminal is a college educated white man. That doesn't say so, anything. It doesn't say anything about <laughs> the more, the likelihood of, of one committing the crime the well, white collar exactly. crime versus Yes, the other. that's what he said. No, he just said the average one is. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Exactly. the average, the average American has one breast and one testicle. It doesn't mean anything. Right. He just said something that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> no, he, he was using that as an example to say that you can't Thank draw you, broad conclusions about white people Thank you, based Brenton. upon the Thank white you, collar James. crime. <laughs> Thank you, James. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. What was your bro- you broader how he inter- he, he, You see how he interrupts when he, when he knows he's wrong about something? No, I had interrupted because I knew that you were wrong about something, and I had let you got, get away for it for call <sighs> after call after call. I think you misunderstood wrong. it. No, he was, he was, he's literally cl- trying to say mm-hmm. that whites in the, in the white-collar world are more likely than blacks in the white-collar world to commit no, white I'm, collar I'm crime. I'm saying the opposite and of that's, that. And I'm that's saying, not true. I'm saying the opposite of that. He, he oh, says, so I'm, oh, I'm you're saying, saying that blacks are more likely to commit white collar crime too? Oh boy. <laughs> no, I'm saying then, that simply because white folks commit more white collar crime does not says nothing about white folks in general. The same yeah. way that that 1.05% says nothing about black folks in general, period. Yeah. By the way, I'll, I'll point something out really quickly here. Mm. What is and is not crime is determined by powerful people within our society. And oftentimes things that should be crimes, for instance, crashing the economy for the entire freaking country, wind up, oh, no, that's not a crime. We can't do anything. In fact, let's help that person. You know, whereas something that does in comparatively less you know, damage, like, I don't know, shoplifting or something, suddenly we come down hard on that. Like, it seems to me that what is and is not a target of the state's violence, and that's really what it is, it's violence coming from the police uh, against our population, is what is most convenient for the elite rich people that uh, control this country. I understand some of that. Well I understand said. that to a point. Well said. Well said, This Brenton. guy. <laughs> Here, let me read. I like him. <laughs> let me read. Here, I thought there was going to be another he, guy who's mad at me. He's a black Republican. He's a so-called black mm-hmm. conservative, Joe from Phoenix. Let me read this for both of you guys. Yeah. And I, I won't hang up on you, Joe, at least not at this point. This is, uh, yeah. law, this is called Law Abidingness. This mm-hmm. is from Race, Evolution, and Behavior, I think, from Philip Rushton. You ever heard of it? Okay. And no, but I'm already like red flags and alarms are sounding in I my know, head. I bet. It sounds like bullshit. <laughs> I bet. Here's here's a this is a line called law abidingness with respect to mm-hmm. gr- to crime. J. Q. Wilson and Hernstein, 1985, review much of the relevant literature. Afro Americans currently a- account for about half of all arrests for assault and murder, and two thirds of all arrests for robbery in the United States. This was back in '85. Even though they con- constitute less than one eighth of the population, since about the pro- since about the same proportion of victims say their assailant was black, the arrest statistics <laughs> cannot be attributed just to police prejudice. And it I goes mean, on to say you blacks, wouldn't do it to just pol- police prejudice, but like this, this is prejudice? the same bad statistics that we've been talking about. Like there's a there's let a, me, a let me million reading. factors. <laughs> okay, keep going. Blacks are also overrepresented according to this book, Race, Evolution, and Behavior, among mm-hmm. persons arrested for most white-collar offenses, overrepresented. For example, in 1980, blacks made up about one-third of those arrested for fraud, forgery, counterfeiting, receiving stolen property, and about one-fourth of those arrested for embezzlement. Blacks are underrepresented only among those white-collar offenses that ordinarily require for their commission access to high-status occupations, tax fraud, securities violations. Interesting. So, huh? well, I, I, well, I don't so know where go. they're getting their statistics from, but I would, I would be, I would, well, yes, but I mean, <laughs> where are they getting that yeah, from? Yeah. Is there a survey? Is it peer reviewed? You know, we, we can't really know. And the way that that article was kind of couched makes it sound like this guy mm-hmm. has an ideological ax to grind. Um, but but don't, don't, don't you guys. I mean, Brenton, everyone does know, to a certain Jeff, extent, Jeff, but like, Brenton. I'm not going to put out an article like that. <laughs> Brenton, Je- Jesse uh-huh. and I just have a, a, a total goal of always p- painting black is bad and white is good. That is the goal, and that is all mm-hmm. that they will ever do. So that's, that, that's I've the heard whole that. process I, of doing that. That's a, that's a, yeah, that's I've a heard smear. that. I hope they can be more. That's a false <laughs> smear from Joe from Phoenix. He just He's biased. Yeah. He's a resentful It is 100% person. accurate, and if you listen to the show for even th- – it's the same same show – Every day, black is bad, white, white is good. That if it's the same show every day, he tunes in every day. He, it must be a pretty good show. 
<laughs> just like just that like, doesn't answer the like, question, but I like see what you hate, mean. Hatewatch.org does, and right, RightWingWatch.org does too, James. Huh? They watch you Hatewatch.org and RightWingWatch.org. Oh, right. Yeah, and a bunch of commies. It's a pretty I good know. show. I don't blame them for watching. By the way, I'm so, pretty well. The, I'm. I don't mm-hmm. darken people's spirits with my with my stuff. <laughs> I mean, uh, we talked Stop about that. We talked about that on the thing. Like, if you're fanning the flames of racial hatred, you know, you kind of darken people's. But I'm not lives. fanning any flames yeah. of racial hatred. I'm I'm telling some factual stuff about you know what's wrong with the blacks and what's happening. But yeah, but what, we're what's the overall narrative of that? What's yeah. wrong with, with with the blacks? One point zero five percent is the blacks, huh, huh, James? No, there's there's more there's more wrong with the blacks than just the violent crime. You are part I of mean, what you are. You are an example of something wrong with blacks. You have a dark mindset, Joe. You think that Jesse Lee is preaching hate when all he does is preach love and forgiveness. Uh, I think Jesse you know, does most. He's he's most calling in to complain about Jesse are now. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm, you I'm, are. Debunking, I'm debunking your your BS as usual. But he this is this is like a side point. He, oh yeah, he mm-hmm. said most blacks are retarded, and then he. Uh, when challenged with it, he said, uh, "Is seventy-two percent most meaning seventy-two percent out of wedlock birth, or I feel or like ninety-six percent? Ninety-six. I feel like this whole thing is kind of going way off the rails it is. here. Ninety-six um, percent voting for Obama twice. That's anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think what we voters, not black people, James. See you lying again. It's Brenton, irrelevant. All he it's does. Ir- all he does well, no, no, is that is that lie. is actually relevant of how many people no. like vote. I mean, it's an indicator. It's, it's an, an, no, no, no. Hang on, hang on. It's only lie. certain people vote. No, no. It's, it's a symptom. Lie about black, black folks and black is bad and, and white is good. That is their whole message, Brenton. Period. Yeah. This guy is shallow. Joe is so, shallow. Oh. <laughs> you know, I think what it, it might benefit is a little bit of compassion from everybody to right. take a look at what the other person is saying. Yeah. Validate it Joe has no their, compassion. their worldview and, and engage in good faith. <laughs> yeah. Now, so that cool. said, it doesn't mean that everything that everybody says is correct. And right. it also doesn't necessarily mean that conclusions that may be drawn from it, like no. the idea that blacks James might be somehow James inherently criminal, which is ridiculous. I never suggested that. Yeah, but Brenton, sometimes exactly, Brenton, sometimes exactly people can that take that, 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 that it, Hold on, hold on, Joe. You're, ba- you're babbling. Hatred, you're babbling, Joe. Period. Brenton up, is talking. You're you're being you're, you're being rude to the guest. Shut up, James. <laughs> <laughs> you need your you need <laughs> your Kama Sama Sutra. The ka- ooh, well, the Kame Sutra. <laughs> you just you just fused the Kame Sutra with Goku's Kamehameha. I love that. That's great. <laughs> anyway, Joe, I appreciate it. Nice call. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, keep, keep on lying, James. All right. Talk again. Bye. All right. Bye. Uh, you were Thank saying. Thank you. By the way, I, I like that guy. I'm, I'm glad you two are. Yeah. Are, yeah. Are we're connected. good for each other. <laughs> so, um, no. What? So this is something that I think is really important when we talk to someone else who has a radically different view from us. And I think it's that we need to make Uh, we should make as good an attempt as possible to see things from their point of view, to see where uh, what they are saying is correct and where it does not match up with our experience. And I think we can come to uh, some sort of, you know, even if not agreement, some sort of mutual respect as human beings uh, if we can understand each other. So, you know, I, I think it's better to do that than to hunker down and go into loggerheads. Because oftentimes when you meet a group of people and you start listening to a new teaching or whatever, you just, you immediately compare it to your already held beliefs. And if it matches, you feel validated. And if it conflicts you, you you say, no, 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 I don't believe that, that's not true. And in either case, you learn nothing. So right. even if something that someone is saying is wildly out of proportion and possibly harmful, and I, I do genuinely think that some of the stuff that I've seen come out of, I, I haven't watched a lot of Jessica Lee Peterson, but some of the stuff that I've seen come out of your show could really be taken the wrong way by, by say, people who don't appreciate the subtleties. Um you know, I don't think that's your intention from what I've noticed, but, you know, we, we all do need to be careful about that. You don't want to give the impression, for instance, that, you know, somebody should be afraid of black people 
you know, uh, based upon what is, as we've established, bad statistics. I um, just think that they shouldn't relax. They should be careful, mm -hmm. wary, because crime is on the rise. It's not, I mean, it's, I'm not saying, mm -hmm. oh, just go shoot him or go call the cops anytime you see him. But be wary. Mm -hmm. We have a dangerous world. Just like you say with the China, the China slash communist virus. <laughs> be wary. Be careful. Get you, have your the healthy habits. Virus. <laughs> <laughs> have we your healthy to, habits. Yeah. Uh, we need to talk. We need to, we, we need to at some point, like, because it seems like you've been lumping all <laughs> parts of anything to the left of you into communism. And yes. this kind of reminds me a little bit of like, people on the left who say anything to the right of them is fascism. These are right. actual real movements that, <laughs> you know, to, to be honest, you could be pro like, especially in the United States, there is almost no actual communism. And those communists who are in the United States now have no power. Like, and I, I think it's probably somewhat the other way uh, with regard to, you know, fascists. Um, you know, there are some of them and they are incredibly dangerous. Um, but, you know, they do not represent the majority of even, you know, right wing electoral politics, I don't think. So I, I think we need to not be lazy and just lump all of our all of our, quote unquote, enemies into one bucket. All right. Uh, quick couple of super chats. Man, we got the lines full. I won't be able to get to all of you guys, but I will try <laughs> to do what I can. Azador gave a couple of more super chats on Odyssey. I, the, at, to the Hake report, I sent you the studies on blacks committing white collar crimes at higher rates per capita uh, than whites. Yes, thank you, Asmodor. That was the study. That was the study that I had had read. Mm -hmm. um, he also says crashing the economy is a crime. Tell that guest to stop being anti-Semitic. Whoa. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on. So first off, uh -huh. um, you know, the 2008 crisis like happened as a result of uh, the, the factors were AIG uh, was it was a big part of it, as were the credit default swaps um, and, and like the major rating institutions. This has nothing to do with any particular um, racial group. This has everything to do with the people in power within our society who have all of the money and power and are, we're essentially running a scam on all of us. So, yeah, no, I, I want to make this very clear. There is no racial component to this whatsoever. All right. Uh, Jib Jab says your guest just wanted any reason to say testicle and breast and testicle and testicle <laughs> and breast and breast. Yeah, this yeah, is a that's Christian fun. show. <laughs> <laughs> what? God made testicles? God made whoa, breasts. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm covering my ears. Hey, my favorite caller is on the line, Maze in Dayton, Ohio. She has a question for Brenton about statistics. What's up, Maze? Sure. Hello, Brenton. Hey, Maze. Oh, can I say this first, James? Uh huh. I'm so happy that James found somebody that looked like him that don't think like him. <laughs> the best thing that you ever heard that he, you told him that there's no crime has no color. I've been trying to get through to him for this for years. But when it comes to statistics, you have to look at the people that's doing the statistics to keep the things the way they want it to look like for themselves. But James mm -hmm. don't love himself, and that's his problem. You know what you said yesterday? I keep him at a distance, <laughs> and I don't want them in my neighborhood. Do you think you have a neighborhood uh, guest, or do you think uh, people can afford to live where they want to? She's referring to me. So. She's referring to me responding to a caller who asked, how long have I been racist towards blacks? A black caller. Uh, I'm not responding to and that. And I said, yeah, because I said, I'm not racist towards them. I like them at a distance. And. Okay, but that's where you can see how that's racist. Dude. But it's, it's not racist. <laughs> it's just a lot of people, pe people prefer their own group. And people uh, also, no, you, when you see you a lot of crime coming out of those poor blacks, you don't want to be around that. So and you, you don't want to be around Caucasians. You don't want That's not racism, though. You don't get that. It's, but it's it's maybe one percent, but it's like double and triple what you what you're, the average white that you run into is going to do. No, it's what I'm trying to say. You can see other people's fault, but a, you can't see your own. It's a risk, and I'm glad somebody's sitting there look just like you. That's telling you risk. You don't assessment. get it, and all the people in your chat room mad with him because he's telling the truth. And then on top of that, they may not be, get caught <laughs> for crimes, but they have a crazy attitude that I'm not used to really? dealing with. Really? Yeah. See, he thinks he owns this country. That what he can tell somebody. What I he like is. you guys. And you live in a you don't own land. You don't. You might, what if you they, live in some other minority's apartment and they tell you they don't want you there? What you gonna do? Since discrimination you is a distance. human is a basic human right. Everybody should they have, have the, the right, right to, to own the same. You don't think everybody should have the right to own the same thing? You just think that one group of people should own and control everything. That's what you think. Whatever. That's why you don't you love yourself. 
You don't what? know me. I'm not knowing you. I'm just saying I'm glad the man that's here that's telling you that look like you <laughs> and the ones on Facebook that mad with him because they don't, in the chat room that's mad with him because they don't like what he's telling them. Uh-huh. Are you in, are you crap. watching via Facebook, Maze? Excuse me? You're watching via Facebook? Uh, You don't need to know how I'm watching. I'm watching. I'm just curious, though. I may be watching three or four ways for all you know. <laughs> but as oh. I'm saying to you, for you to do, if you want to do a prayer, do his. This sound more godly than the one that you do, your silent one. Okay. I should do the more godly you try Buddhist that and prayer. See how you try for a month and prayer. see how, how you come out. Have you, I, you should, not, have you, you ever heard of that? Mocha. You should try because Jesse hatred, Peterson's silent prayer. All hate to do is spread harm. And some mm-hmm. of those in your chat room are harmful, hateful people. You don't know what and they're you, doing you in their real life. And you can hear it come out of them every day. I wouldn't doubt people, that most people in my people chat room... Black people are not room, your problem. I keep telling you, black people are not your problem. They're your conscience. I never said they were. They're my conscience. Yes, you did. You said it yesterday. <laughs> black people are the conscience of white people. Uh, so there's thing you do that we wouldn't go even Go on, Brenton. Go ahead. Respond. Okay, Brenton. No. So I'm, I'm happy that you're telling James, even though he's going out of one ear through the other one, <laughs> and go over there and get his uh, big boss and give him some of it, too, if he ever have you on his show. And it'd be a good thing. So you have a good one, and I have to go. Thank you, Mays. Appreciate you. Take care. Go. She was lovely. Yeah, she's nice. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. So I guess what I kind of want to say um, as a, as my reaction to what she had was that, you know, there are times that people can be, we do have to all be mindful and to keep ourselves safe in the world. But we also want to make sure that, you know, our brains tend to pay attention more to things that uh, could hurt us than would benefit us. Um, for instance, you know, you notice the, the image behind me, uh, there's a lot of red in that image. And one of the reasons why and a lot of, you know, comic covers uh, that come out have a lot of red in them, because the brain latches onto the blood, because that could be dangerous. Our ego, it, its main job is essentially to function as a radar. Is there anything in the way? How do I keep this particular organism alive? The problem is, is when you identify yourself with your ego, you naturally identify yourself into a state of perpetual anxiety. And this can cause a great deal of fear that is simply not logical or rational and can actually trip you up. Again, it's another reason why, you know, you might want to try Daimoku. (laughs) And I'll tell you what, I'll look into the silent prayer thing as well. Um, But like, you know, one of the things that I I learned uh, when I was traveling from place to place and living, you know, in the woods, uh, you know, miles from civilization with no police to help me is I, I realized, you know, when you meet somebody in Georgia or you meet somebody in Maine or you meet somebody somewhere in between, by and large, most people are good. And they're going to be helpful to you, you know, unless you're acting like a dick or something. And that oftentimes we will overemphasize threats from this group or that group. When in fact, again, as I said, we're just complicated humans trying to relate to each other. It was very scary when I first moved to New York and I was in, you know, a neighborhood where I, as a white guy for the first time, was a minority, you know. Um, And, you know, I'd be coming home very, very late at night. And for the first a uh, couple of months, I carried a knife on me everywhere I went because I'd been mugged before. Uh, and I was worried that such a thing might happen in big, bad New York City. Um, and then one night I lost I lost the knife in a, in a sushi restaurant and I realized I don't actually need it. Like uh, the, right. I, yeah, there are, and, and in 10 years, I never had a problem because I listened to my gut and um, I also kept myself open, uh, you know, to, my neighbors who were different from me, but ultimately were, uh, they were wonderful people. Okay. Um, let me talk to my producer says a sensible black William in California wants to talk with you. <laughs> William, how are you doing? Right. Here we go. Oh, I'm doing pretty good. How you doing, man? Doing well. Thank you. Here's good, good to meet you. You're, you're on with Brenton. Brenton. How you doing, man? I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> That's good, man. You know what, man? To be honest with you, man, I would probably like you if I ever met you and probably do things together, but I'm going to tell you where the line would be crossed. Mm-hmm. And somebody told me this. This was my grandfather in 1967. Were you around then? Nope. <laughs> okay, I think I might trust him a little bit better. He told me the last thing in the world, and at that time in 1967, you know, blacks had a lot of problems. You know that. 
I mean, you know, yes, everybody has a lot of problems and things well, tend to be worse. Well, you know, that was, a, that, was a, that was a pretty important time. But mm-hmm. I was only seven, and you weren't there. But I can mm-hmm. tell you what that old man told me. The last thing, and this is facts, the last thing that black people need is a white man taking up for them. We don't need mm-hmm. nobody taking up for us. That's like, you know, a little child acting out and allowing him to do that. Here's the, here's the worst thing in the world for black people. Affirmative action, Black Lives Matter, Al Sharpton, all of that Wait, crap. So and, Al, and, Al and it sounds black very guy, unpatriotic. Right? And you know what? The best thing mm-hmm. that happened to black people in this country is patriotism. You know, being a patriot. Excuse me. I, mm-hmm. You know, being a patriot is what it's all about, man. You know, you're kind of like, I mean, I like you. You're well spoken. <laughs> but I'm telling you, Thank you, if you don't see the crime rising in this country right now, if you don't see the blacks acting out in this country right now, that's your problem. Because I'm black. I'm qualified. I see it. Mm -hmm. Okay? We only make up 13% of the population. Here's the fact. 13% of the population in every year we represent over 50% of the crime. Yeah, we we talked about this earlier on the show. I appreciate it, William, man. I kind of keep on moving. But thank you for Keep your input, moving, man. man. But hey, man, Britain, nice meeting you and everything, man. Maybe you might want to think twice about that, man. You know, they don't they don't need you to take up for them. They need to yes. straighten out. So, we need to straighten out our communities. So what I what I want to what I want to emphasize here. A caller is, called in just yeah. to let you know this is a yeah. family friendly show. Child <laughs> children sometimes listen, so avoid the cuss words. Oh, okay. A caller Did I cuss? About that. You you said a couple of bad words. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a good idea to consider a part of the body, uh, but I understand that some people. No, he was think referring that that's rude. to the D word. You said being a D word. Oh, and you know, you know what, Brenton, to tell you said, the truth, are, you, are you familiar with the Black Panthers, Brenton? Yeah, yeah. Very familiar. No, you're not. Because they're a spinoff. The group in the 60s <laughs> is a spinoff. The Black no, no, Panthers yeah. are the Hang 761st on. Battalion. Go look mm-hmm. it up. Oh, that black. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm also familiar. Those with Those are the original of black, black yeah. Panthers. Check out. I, their I thought you were talking about like the new black and they Panthers faced versus real the racism black while Panthers. they were fighting for this country to make it free for me and you today. Mm-hmm. Go look at their documentary, and you'll kind of understand what I'm saying. Thanks, we William. don't need anybody white taking up for us. But you have a good day, Brandon. Nice meeting you, buddy. Absolutely. Um, so what I what I wanted to say to that is I am not taking up for anyone. I'm speaking for myself. Uh, from the way that I see the world. Uh, I talked earlier about um, this being partially a hobby and and partially a religious duty of mine, because I am obliged to confront slanderers of the Lotus Sutra. And uh, I I find oftentimes when people are making very broad statements about whole groups of people, that that is a very major slander of the sutra. So yeah, I'm sure blacks, black people are perfectly capable for speaking for themselves and they absolutely should. I am simply giving my perspective as an individual. All right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like when, uh, blacks say you don't, you can't speak for black people. You don't know what it is to experience racism. Give me a break. This is America. We have the freedom of speech, even if you're wrong, mm-hmm. man. Well, yeah. I, I, there's there's two sides to that. Uh-huh. There, there, yeah. So the one side is you don't want to speak authoritatively about something you don't have a lot of experience in, but also the idea that somebody the, the the flip side where I will agree with you on that is just because someone doesn't necessarily have a ton of direct experience doesn't mean they don't know what they're talking about or right. shouldn't be able to to speak to it. I, I think there's a we can find a middle ground there because I think there's valid points on both sides. You know, I really wanted to get to all the callers, but we are at the bottom of the hour, and I want to, I, ha- I have to end it. Um, I, yeah. Donning Armour wanted to talk about racial realism, Buddhism versus atheism, but he'll have to call another mm-hmm. time or maybe call you some, at some point. Skip in sure. Augusta, Georgia wanted to know if Brenton believes in white privilege, but I can't get to I these mean- guys. Yeah, in the that it exists, there there are privileges that certain people in society get for being white, but privileges and are attached to every uh, identity that you can have. So, um, give the people how to get in contact with you if they want to contact you, and and I know that you've yeah, been putting sure. out some some content, comics and yeah. Stuff. 
Go for it. Well, this is really exciting. Yeah. So I have a Kickstarter running right now. If you go on Kickstarter and you search Daruti, D-U-R-R-U-T-I, uh, it is Daruti Shadow of the People. Uh, this is a biopic slash war epic about anarchist Buenaventura Daruti, uh, who defeated the fascists in Barcelona and led an army of 10,000 anarchists against Francisco Franco. Um, it's a, an incredible story of a guy who started out uh, as a union member and uh, bank robber uh, and rose to challenge a dictator uh, and liberated an entire city. So uh, we're doing really, really well. The book is funded. Um, so if you want to get on there, uh, just come on uh, and uh, toss in, grab yourself a copy of the book. I'm also the author of Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, the Same. Ringo nominated comic book series. Um, you can find me on YouTube. Just search my name, Brenton Lengel, uh, at Brenton Lengel on Twitter uh, and my website, www.brentonlengel.com. Well, I appreciate you coming on. It was fun to talk with you. Uh, maybe we'll talk again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. This was very stimulating. Brenton Langle, everybody. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.